<clears throat> okay, Romans chapter 11. And um, so we have come up to verse 11 in this chapter. So again, Paul asks the question in verse 1, hath God cast away his people? And his answer is, God forbid. And uh, again, that as you go on in the chapter, it becomes clear that the question there really is, has God completely and forever cast away his people? And the answer is God forbid. And then he um, gives two main arguments um, for why he says God forbid. And then uh, he quotes some passages from the old uh, from the Old Testament about if you look especially in verse 7, 8, 9, 10, um, where he talks about God giving them, giving Israel a spirit of slumber. And if you notice in verse 9, he says their table will be made a stumbling block. And uh, so as we studied, we saw that was fulfilled in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's when Christ was a stumbling stone and they stumbled over him. So then verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So again, it's important to note carefully the question that is asked in verse 11. So the, the question is not, have they stumbled? The answer to that is clearly yes. Paul taught that already in chapter 9, as we looked at briefly a couple of weeks ago, and also here in chapter 11, the verses that he just quoted from the Old Testament. So clearly they have stumbled. And again, that took place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and also the question in verse 11 is not, have they fallen? Because the answer to that also is yes, they have fallen. And if that's not real clear yet at this point, it will be as we move along in the chapter. So the question is, have they stumbled that they should fall? So the question is not, did they stumble or did they fall? But it has to do with the, the purpose. Why, why did they stumble? Why did God give them a spirit of slumber and make their table a stumbling block and so forth? What, what was God's purpose in how he dealt with Israel? So that's the question. Uh, and again, have they stumbled that they should fall? And Paul's answer again is, God forbid. God's ultimate purpose in them stumbling was not that they should fall. He has some other purpose for that, and we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Um, and then he goes on and tells us in verse 11 what the purpose was. But rather, so their purpose is not that they should, God's purpose is not that they should fall, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So you see clearly in verse 11 that they did fall because he says through their fall, salvation has come. So they did fall. And as we saw last week, they, their fall took place in Acts chapter 7, when they blasphemed against the Holy Ghost, uh, and that was culminated with them stoning Stephen to death. And again, Stephen was a man full of the Holy Ghost, as we saw last week. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is something that's very important to understand verse 11 and, and to understand many things. Um, there are sometimes people have the idea if they just have a, a little bit of exposure to uh, the so-called grace teaching, they have the idea that we are saying that Gentiles could not be saved or there was no Gentile plan for, sal uh, no plan for Gentile salvation until the dispensation of grace. And that is absolutely not true. From the very beginning when God chose Abraham, God made it clear that all the families of the earth were to be blessed. So there, there was always a plan. Uh, God always had a plan for Gentiles to be saved. But the key thing to understand is, according to prophecy, Jerusalem had to be saved first. 
And then after that, salvation would go out to the Gentiles through Israel. And we could look at many verses, but uh, we'll just look at a couple. Look in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12, and Gene Gross, if you read verse 7. Zechariah 12, 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Um. Sorry, that's not the verse I wanted. Um, it'll it'll come to me later, but uh, there's a lot of other verses we can look at. So um, turn to, we'll come back to that, but turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And beginning in verse 46. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So the plan there is for the gospel to be preached among all nations. It's not only for the Jews, but it's clear that it is to begin at Jerusalem. Uh, and then also Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Uh, and RJ, would you read that? Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the othermost part of the earth. So you see there, there's a definite order of salvation. It, it, Jerusalem must be saved first. And then it goes to Judea and Samaria, uh, Samaria Galilee, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But again, it must begin in Jerusalem. So that, that is, uh, and again, there are many other passages we could look at, um, and we will look at more later, but that clearly is the plan for salvation for Gentiles, is that Israel would be saved first, and then salvation would go to the Gentiles. But when we come to Acts chapter 7, uh, prior to that, everything is going according to prophecy. But when we come to Acts chapter 7, something unexpected happened. So even though Jerusalem rejected Christ, crucified him, and then they blasphemed against the Holy Ghost, nevertheless, as we're, we continue reading through the book of Acts, we find salvation going out to the Gentiles. So, for example, look to Acts chapter 13. And so this is key to understanding the verses we're talking about now, um, but it's also key to understanding the Bible as a whole, is to understand that God had a plan for Gentiles to be saved, but his plan was that they should be saved through Israel, that Israel would be saved first, and then salvation would go from Israel to the Gentiles. But now Israel stumbled and then they fell. So you would think there's no real opportunity for Gentiles to be saved at that point. And on the contrary, as we will read some passages here, salvation goes out to the Gentiles. So this is not according to prophecy because Israel has not been saved yet. Um, so Acts chapter 13, and Richard, would you read verses 44 to 46? And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things 
which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Um, so the main thing I want to note in these verses is the end of verse 46, where Paul says, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And that this, again, is not according to prophecy, because according to prophecy, Jerusalem had to be saved first. Uh, but nevertheless, there, Paul's turning to the Gentiles. Uh, another thing I want you to note in this passage in verse 45 it says, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. So just take note of that for now, that the Jews here are filled with envy. All right, then uh, turn to chapter 18 in the book of Acts. Chapter 18, and Dick, would you read verses 4 through 6? Okay. Okay. Acts 18, 4 through 6. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opened them, excuse me, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, for henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. So notice here at the end of verse 5, it says they testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So that was the main issue for the Jews, uh, even in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They refused to believe that Jesus was Christ. And what is their response here in verse 6? They opposed themselves and blasphemed. So take note of that word blasphemed. The Jews blasphemed here. Uh, and then Paul says in verse 6, from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And again, this is contrary to prophecy. Uh, and then chapter 18, um, sorry, 22, chapter 22 in the book of Acts. Chapter 22, and Sharon, would you read verses 17 through 21? And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Okay, this passage makes makes this point very clear that salvation was going out to the Gentiles, but not according to prophecy. Because uh, in this passage, it says in verse 18, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. And again, that's where salvation was supposed to begin. For they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. So clearly Jerusalem did not and will not receive the gospel and yet despite that at the end of verse 21 i will send thee far hence unto the gentiles so clearly salvation is going to the gentiles but not according to prophecy and then one more and that's in chapter 28 in the book of acts chapter 28 and uh, beginning in verse 25 and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias as the prophet unto our fathers. 
saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. So Paul is in Rome here speaking to a group of Jews in Rome, and he quotes the passage from Isaiah that he also quotes from in Romans 11. And we, we studied that passage in some detail. And then verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. So here are some clear passages in the book of Acts where we find salvation going out to the Gentiles, but not only is it not through Jerusalem, but Jerusalem has refused to receive the truth, and yet salvation is going out to the Gentiles. Uh, turn back to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, 6, 0, and uh, on we read the first three verses in Isaiah 60. Okay, Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings of the brightness of thy rising. So here's another Old Testament passage where it makes it clear that God had a plan for Gentile salvation, but his plan was that they be saved through Israel. So in this passage, we find the Gentiles are in darkness, but in verse 1, Isaiah says to Israel, arise, arise, shine. Uh, and then verse 3, the Gentiles shall come to thy light. So in the Old Testament, God's plan was that Israel would rise and light would come to Israel, and then salvation would go out to the Gentiles. But now, as we're reading in the book of Acts and in, in Romans, we find that Israel did not rise, but instead they stumbled and fell. So how, how then could salvation be going out to the Gentiles? Salvation was to go to the Gentiles through the rise of Israel. But now we see Israel fell, and yet salvation is going out to the Gentiles. And there's only one explanation for that, and this is key to, again, not only understanding the verses we're looking at now, but uh, understanding the whole Bible. And that is to understand that at this point, God introduced a new dispensation. God, God set aside the, the, the fulfillment of prophecy at that time, and he began a new dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God, and uh, introduced through Paul a new gospel, and, and began the church, the body of Christ. And that's the only way that salvation could be going out to the Gentiles just not through the rise of Israel, but in fact, it's through the fall of Israel. Um, you're familiar with these verses, but uh, let's just read briefly Ephesians chapter 3. And Paul, we, we've studied all the verses where Paul uses, or uses the word mystery or mysteries, um, but this is when God introduced the mystery and again, things are not going any longer according to prophecy, but they're now going according to this mystery revealed. So Ephesians chapter 3 is one of the great passages where Paul talks about this, beginning in verse 1. 
For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So Paul makes it clear that even though Israel fell, salvation is now going out to the Gentiles through this mystery program. Uh, and then one more, again, we could look at many more, but uh, in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, and would Dan or Laura read verses 25 and 26? Sorry, you were garbled. Did you say my name? Um, I said Dan or Laura. Oh, okay. Okay, <clears throat> whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And so, and then if you go on to verse 27, it talks about the riches of this, the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And so, again, Paul speaks about this many times. So, this is key. Uh, not only to understanding what Paul says in Romans 11, but again, to understanding the Bible, is to understand that God had a plan for Gentiles to be saved through the rise of Israel. But then as we're reading through the Bible, we find that Israel falls rather than rises. And yet, surprisingly, salvation goes out to the Gentiles. And the reason for that is, again, because at that time, God revealed the mystery and began a new dispensation. All right, then go back to Romans 11. And so in Romans 11, uh, again, Paul says, I say then, have, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. Again, that is contrary to prophecy for that to take place. Um, and then verse 11 continues, for to provoke them to jealousy. So God's ultimate purpose for Israel was not that they should fall. God says, Paul says, God forbid to that idea. But rather through their fall, salvation would come to the Gentiles and that would provoke Israel to jealousy. So that's God's purpose for Israel stumbling and then ultimately falling. Um, I want to, to, and many of you have heard me talk about this before, but one of my pet peeves is that people, including most Christians, misuse and misunderstand the words jealousy and envy. And so, Notice in verse 11, it's for to provoke them to jealousy, not to envy, but to jealousy. And I pointed out to you uh, in one of the passages we read in the book of Acts that it says the Jews were filled with envy. They weren't filled with jealousy. They were filled with envy. So those, it's important that we understand those words and use them correctly. And so, Envy is always a bad thing. And the Bible never says that God is envious. It's always a bad thing. Because envy 
always has to do with you wanting what rightfully belongs to someone else. So I can envy your, your house, your car, your wife, your money. I can envy any of those things. And that's a bad thing if I have envy because those things belong to you. But um, oftentimes people say, you know, he's jealous of her or she's so jealous. And actually what, and they use that in a negative way, but actually what they mean is he's so envious or she's so envious. So jealousy is not a bad thing. Um, many times in the Bible, it says that God is a jealous God. And here in Romans 11, 11, God's purpose was that Israel would become jealous. So that can't be a bad thing if that's God's purpose. So jealousy always has to do with what belongs to me. So you you cannot be jealous uh, of my of my wife or my house or my car or my money or anything else because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. You can envy those things, and and that's a bad thing if you do. But I, on the other hand, I can be and I ought to be jealous of my wife. Um, especially and 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 my e even other things, my house, my car, my money, and so forth. I can be jealous of those things because they belong to me. They don't belong to you. They belong to me. So that's why God is a jealous God, because He His glory is His glory. It doesn't belong. <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> uh, it doesn't belong to anyone else. It, it belongs to him. So that's why he can be jealous for his glory, his name, because those things belong to him. So it's important that you understand and make that distinction between envy and jealousy. Envy is always a bad thing, and God is never envious. Jealousy is a good thing in, in most cases. And again, God is a jealous God. So in verse 11, his intention, his purpose is to provoke them to jealousy. And so once they're provoked to jealousy, the idea is that Israel would desire the salvation that had been offered to them. So Israel was God's chosen nation, and he was the God of Israel. And he came, Jesus Christ came to Israel, and, and he, he died for Israel. So salvation belonged to them. It was theirs. But they had no concern for it, no care for it. They rejected it. And so God's purpose is, I, for Israel, I want you to be jealous of the salvation that rightfully belongs to you. And so I, I want you to want that salvation, desire it. Um, so that's the idea in verse 11. So God's ultimate purpose was not that Israel should fall, but rather that through their fall, salvation would come to the Gentiles, and that Gentile salvation would then provoke Israel to jealousy so that they would want the salvation that God had promised them that was rightfully theirs. So that's the idea in, uh, in verse 11. All right, then we'll go on to Romans 11 and verse 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should, oh, sorry, I'm reading 11, verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So the, the fall of Israel, we see in verse 12, had resulted in the riches of the world. 
And again, that is not according to prophecy. In the Old Testament, again and again and again, it talks about how when Israel rises, when Israel is saved, then riches will go out to the world. But here we find Israel has fallen, and despite that, the riches have gone out into the world. So notice again in verse 12, it's clear that Israel has fallen. He says, now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world. Uh, and the, the riches of the world relates back to the salvation that he has come to the Gentiles in verse 11. So he says in verse 12, now, if the fall of them, Israel, be the riches of the world. So in the context, what are the riches of the world? That's, again, the salvation that has gone to the Gentiles that he spoke about in verse 11. And again, that was completely unexpected in prophecy and contrary to prophecy. Uh, turn back to Genesis chapter 22. So we, uh, we read earlier in Isaiah 60 that Israel was to rise and shine, and then the Gentiles would come to Israel's light. Um, but as I say, it goes all the way back to Abraham, that God promised uh, Gentile salvation through Israel. So in Genesis chapter 22, and beginning in verse 17, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So again, right from the beginning from Abraham, God had a plan that all the nations of the earth should be blessed. But he says in verse 18, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So, uh, and by the way, this is, the seed here is not Jesus Christ, um, because in verse 17, he says, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven as a sandwich is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. So there, there are not multitudes of different Christs. There's only one Christ. But what Paul, uh, what uh, Moses is talking about here is a multiplied seed as the stars of the heaven and as a sand which is upon the sea. So he's referring to the, the seed of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, the Jews. And so that was God's plan of salvation in the Old Testament. Okay, then uh, go back to Romans 11. And so again, God's plan was that the Gentiles would be saved through the rise of Israel. But now Paul explains in Romans 11 that Gentiles are being saved through the fall of Israel. And that you don't read about in the Old Testament. So the, these riches of the world in Romans 11, 12 did not come to the world by prophecy. Instead, they come through the mystery, through the dispensation of the grace of God given to Paul. Then also in Romans 11, 12, um, Paul says, and the diminishing of them, the diminishing of Israel, the riches of the Gentiles, so the diminishing of Israel has resulted in the riches of the Gentiles. And again, that's as we've been talking about, the riches of the Gentiles. Now there's um, that, that diminishing in verse 12. Many of you have seen dispensational charts. And uh, in, on many of them, in the Book of Acts period, there will be a line um, beginning in Acts chapter 7, and there will be a line that gradually goes down until you come to the end of the book of Acts. And that is labeled diminishing. And so in those charts, they interpret this diminishing 
um, seemingly, it's it's a gradual decline of Israel's program from chapter seven to chapter twenty-eight. But that's not what this diminishing is talking about. The the diminishing of them in verse twelve is talking about them diminishing in number. So that goes back to verse five, where he says, "Even so, at this present time also there is a remnant." According to, according to the election of grace. So uh, Israel is diminished down to this remnant. And uh, of course, as the remnant dies, they're going to diminish further and further until no one left from that program is alive anymore. But that the diminishing here again is talking about a decline in number down to that remnant. So that the majority of the nation of Israel had fallen from that special place of blessing and privilege. And now the only thing remaining is a little flock, that, that remnant, according to the election of grace. Um, and so again, you would think that the diminishing of Israel would mean there's not going to be salvation for the Gentiles, but the very opposite has happened. The diminishing of them has brought the riches of the Gentiles. And again, that can only be through the introduction of a new dispensation, a new gospel. Uh, and then continuing in verse 12, he says, uh, let me start at the beginning. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So Paul says the Gentiles will be even more blessed through Israel's fullness. So they're being blessed now through Israel's fall and diminishing, but he clearly indicates in verse 12 that they're going to be even more blessed at some point through Israel's fullness. So what, what is the fullness in verse 12? What it seems quite clear, just looking at verse 12, that the fullness is the opposite of the fall and the diminishing. And so one day Israel is going to be restored to that position from which they fell. And Israel is going to, is no longer, one day Israel is no longer going to be a very small remnant, but they will be, um, he, he says later in Romans 11, all Israel shall be saved. And so that's, that's what the fullness is in verse 12. It's the opposite or the reverse of their fall and diminishing. Um, Turn back to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. <clears throat> and this is the verse in Zechariah that I was thinking of earlier. Um, so Zechariah chapter 8, and George, would you read verses 22 and 23? And you caught me. It's been a while since I've been to Zechariah. <laughs> That's uh, right at the end of the Old Testament, just before Malachi. So almost the end of the Old Testament. And we want Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah 8. And what verses? I'm sorry. 22 and 23. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in, the, in those days it shall come to pass that ten, mount, ten men shall take hold of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, and we have heard that God is with you. Yeah, so in, note in verse 22, it says, uh, many people and strong nations 
shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. Well, from Acts chapter 7 and onwards up to today, if someone is going to seek the Lord, Jerusalem is not a good place to go because Jerusalem rejected the Lord. But that's what they're doing here in verse 22. They're going to Jerusalem to seek the Lord. And then in verse 23, it says, 10 men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So here's another Old Testament passage where you see the Gentiles are saved through the Jews. So clearly here, Jerusalem is saved and the Jews know the Lord. And so the Gentiles are grabbing hold of the skirt of a Jew because they want to know, they want the Jews to tell them about how they can find the Lord. Uh, then also, go back to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, and Meg, would you read the first three verses in Isaiah 2? Isaiah 2, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above all the hills and all nations shall flow in unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So you see in verse one, this prophecy concerns Judah and Jerusalem. And in verse two, it says that the, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. So that's in Jerusalem and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. So all nations are going to flow unto Jerusalem and Judah. Um, and in verse 3, many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So again, how are the nations going to know the Lord and know the word of the Lord? It's good, the word of the Lord is going to go forth from Jerusalem. So again, that's the Old Testament plan for Gentile salvation. But when we come to the book of Acts chapter seven and onwards, the word of the Lord is not going forth from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is rejecting the word of the Lord, and yet Gentiles are being saved. And then uh, one more in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, and would Dan or Lisa read verse 24? Revelation 21, 24. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. So and here, I'm sorry. Um, so here, that's okay. Uh, so here you have nations which are saved, and that they're walking in the light of it. What what is it? It's heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, and then again in verse 24, the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So again, that's 
that's the Old Testament plan for Gentiles to be saved. They were to be saved through Israel. Um, and they still will be, as Dan just read it here in the book of Revelation. But that's not what is taking place today. Je and, and yet Gentiles are being saved. Um, turn to the book of Joel. Joel ch chapter 2. I used to always know where it was. Where is it? So Joel chapter 2, um, if you go back and find Daniel, and then just go a little further, you'll come soon to Joel. So Joel chapter 2, and would Tim or Jean read verse 32? Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Okay, Joel 2, 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. So in this verse, where is deliverance found? It says the name of the Lord, uh, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered where? In Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And then notice it goes on, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom they shall call. So according to prophecy, where is salvation? Where is deliverance found? It's found in Jerusalem, and it's found in that remnant. And yet, again, we come to the book of Acts, and Jerusalem rejects the word of the Lord. There's no deliverance found in Jerusalem. Now turn to the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and Gabrielle, would you read verse 1? Acts 8, 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So here, of course, this is right after the stoning of Stephen. And so here there's a persecution in Jerusalem, and all the disciples were scattered from Jerusalem, except the apostles. So if you want to find salvation and deliverance at this point, Jerusalem is not the place to go. That's the place to go if you want to be persecuted, but not the place to go if you want to find salvation and deliverance. And then uh, Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> Acts chapter 9 and beginning in verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. Uh, and this is uh, uh, speaking, the Lord speaking to Ananias. So again in verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he, and he's referring here to Saul or Paul, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou, as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So Acts 9 in the Bible marks a major change because the leader of the rebellion in Israel gets saved in Acts chapter 9 and is told that he will be sent to the Gentiles. So from this point on, deliverance and salvation are no longer in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has rejected the gospel, rejected salvation. And so a change of dispensation occurs here. 
Um, and so again, as we have read in several passages today, according to prophecy, Jerusalem and to Judah, uh, sorry, Jerusalem and Judah were to be saved first. But now Jerusalem stumbled and fell and they're persecuting the gospel. Uh, look in um, Acts chapter 10. And this is a fairly lengthy passage. Um, I think you're all generally kind of familiar with what takes place in this chapter, but um, we won't read a lot of it. But Acts chapter 10 and verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me, and this is Peter, God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask, therefore, for what intent ye have sent me. The, the commentators typically explain Acts chapter 10 as though Peter was was biased and prejudiced against gentiles and uh, so god god had to overcome peter's prejudice against gentiles and get him to go to cornelius but peter wasn't prejudiced against gentile peter believed the word of god and the word of god said that jerusalem must be saved first you don't go to the Gentiles until Jerusalem is saved. And as Peter is here in Acts chapter 10, Jerusalem is not saved. So that's why Peter is hesitant here. Uh, and then if you go down in chapter 10 to verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And these were these would be Gentiles. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So our, our time is almost up for today, but the point here in Acts chapter 10 is not that Peter was prejudiced against Gentiles or didn't like Gentiles. Um, and that's also not why the Jews here are astonished that the Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost. All of this has to do because as we have read several passages tonight, they're correct understanding was that salvation had to come to Jerusalem first and then Judea and Samaria um, and but it had not in fact they had rejected the word of God so that's why Peter was hesitant here because it was not proper according to prophecy for Peter to go to Gentiles at this point and these Jews, according to prophecy, would not expect to see Gentiles being saved and receiving the Holy Ghost. But God is preparing Peter here uh, to, to gain an understanding of the fact that a new dispensation has been introduced, that Israel has fallen, and yet salvation is going to go out to the Gentiles because of this new dispensation. And uh, next time we'll begin, uh, we'll look at a couple passages where I believe it clearly confirms what I just said about Peter and the purpose of what happened here in Acts 10. But we will stop there for today. So thank you all.